hello, everybody. I am, I'm very glad to be here. I've had a good time so far. I'll try not to ruin it in the next hour. <laughs> uh, the title of this talk is, Why Are We Talking About Science at Atheist Conferences? And the reason I brought that up is because usually when I go to conferences in the States, you know, I'm, I'm one of those new atheists, the Richard Dawkins style atheists, and there's always this little cohort of us scientists, physicists and biologists and so forth, and we're all up there babbling about science. And it's a curious thing, if you think about it. You know, we don't have atheists speaking at, at science conferences. And Lord knows the Christians don't have scientists talking at their conference. Why is it that we've got scientists talking about science at Atheist Conference? There's a problem here in, in that I gave this title to the organizers a long time ago. And then, of course, I see the schedule and I notice we're not talking about science here at all. <laughs> so in, in a sense, you're ahead of the curve. That's OK, because what my lesson here is, what I want to say is, that while science, broadly defined, is the essential foundation of the modern atheist movement, science isn't enough. I think we all know this, that science is important, but it's not the totality of the atheist movement. Um, the, what we have to do is we have to go beyond describing what the world is, which is what science does really, really well, to what we want the world to be. And that requires the infusion of humanist values to determine what direction we want to take. That can't be determined by science, although science can help us get there. Again, how we will achieve those goals, whatever they are, however we define them. Oh. <laughs> it's an alarm. Uh, how we will achieve those goals is going to require the application of science again, which means we scientists have guaranteed a future employment, which is great. Uh, but science, we have to remember, is a tool, not the end result of what we're after. We are not aiming for a world of science. We are aiming for a world that is just and equitable and humane for all human humanity. Okay, so what is this science that I'm babbling about? I'm using this word in the broadest sense as a method for assessing truth claims. Human beings have a great many methods for determining the truth of a claim. We could, for instance, flip a coin. We could interpret the flight of birds or the configuration of goat entrails. We could consult a prophet or a holy book. Or we could settle it with trial by combat, which is always fun. And those are, those are methods that people have historically used and that some of them people still use. We've tried them all. And many people still rely on variations of these methods to puzzle out what's going on around them. So as one example, I rec recommend looking up a website called Rapture Ready. There's a whole bunch of worried people on there, and they're struggling to comprehend their world by matching modern events to Bible prophecy. It's the craziest thing you'll ever see. But there they are, and they, they think of this as a reasonable way to resolve their concerns about the world. But here's the thing about those methods. They don't work. Well, they, they sort of work in the sense of what they do is they provide a trigger to motivate people to do something. But the connection to reality is, is very tenuous. There's no solid reinforcement of real world concerns there. Science, on the other hand, uses observations of the world to infer patterns and causes of real phenomena. The connection is direct. And it's determined by the application of logic. And most importantly, it's repeatedly tested. We don't simply accept an initial conclusion as a given. We go over it and over it and over again, again, checking to make sure it's right. So science is a kind of filter. We can constantly throw more data and more inferences into our net. And we winnow out the falsehoods. And we retain the provisionally valid explanations. Uh, we don't obtain absolute certainty or absolute truth but we do gradually ratchet our way to operationally useful truths. So that's what we're dealing with in science, is what works. Now, we use science all the time in our daily life. Uh, you buy a used car, for instance, and you discover it's a lemon. Uh, your brother-in-law buys a used car from the same dealer, and it's also a lemon. So then what you do is you reasonably see a pattern, and you infer that the dealer is not trustworthy. 
Us skeptics and atheists and scientists so take this method for granted that we often have difficulty recognizing that other people use very different protocols. For instance, some people will use the datum that the dealer attends the same church as they do as evidence that they are trustworthy, when in fact that observation has no logical connection to the reality of their behavior. We see the same dichotomy at grander scales. Uh, look at the climate change debate, for instance. Scientists have accumulated a large body of data that inescapably points to the unpleasant conclusion that human be behavior has shifted the balance of planetary carbon cycling in the direction of heating the planet. That's a fact. That's a conclusion from the evidence. And it's demonstrated by chemistry, geology, physics, biology, and is more than adequately backed up by the mathematics. That is the result of using science to determine your assessments. But many people disagree because they do not use science. We have to recognize that. These people are actually not operating in a scientific mode of thinking. For instance, we have members of the American Congress who declared that global climate change cannot occur because the Bible says it can't. <laughs> After the great flood, they say, God promised that he wouldn't inflict mankind with such disasters ever again. Therefore, it's not going to happen. Ignore the evidence. We got the Bible. Others will cite the god of capitalism. That is, curbing CO2 emissions would affect profits. Therefore, it can't be happening. Nothing can compromise profits. And again, these non-scientific methods of determining the truth are poorly connected to reality, and they lead to false conclusions, but they are the ways that many people do think. Not us, of course. Other people. <laughs> now, I have, to, I have to briefly digress to counter one objection I often hear, at least I often hear it in the US, maybe you don't get this in, in, in Germany, but it's an objection called presuppositionalism, and it's often thrown about creationists and other science deniers, and you'll hear it a lot if you visit the United States and talk to Christians there. That is, presuppositionalists argue that so science operates using a set of unprovable assumptions and that creationism, for instance, simply makes a different set of equally valid but unprovable assumptions. Therefore, they're equivalent. It's just, it's just a matter of which assumption you start with. You can go either way, and they're logically equivalent. Uh, this isn't correct, because scientists make in inferences about the world from observations of the world, while presuppositionalists make inferences about the world from interpretations of a holy book. They are remote from the phenomenon they're trying to describe. Scientists' claims are based on empirical foundation and are cross-checked against the phenomenon they try to describe. Presuppositionalist claims are unmoored from reality and are only checked for internal consistency. And even that is usually very poorly done. You know, I, I suppose you could construct an interesting predictive model of how the world works based on assuming that Harry Potter is true. But it would fail as soon as it was trying to address the muggleness of reality. It just wouldn't fit anymore. The bottom line here is that while science cannot claim to have a direct line to absolute truth and also cannot claim to be the only method to assess the truth, it is still the best method we've got. And unlike those other methods, methods has a demonstrable record of concretely improving our understanding of reality. Science works. Science is the process that does its damnedest to figure out how stuff actually works rather than how we wished it worked. Which brings us to the atheist movement. Every movement, every worldview out there purports to be reality-based. Reality Catholics, for instance, would claim relevance because their beliefs are founded on the premises of their version of reality, which has an afterlife and a supernatural tyrant in the sky and redemption through belief in a Jesus Christ figure. That's their starting assumptions. And they think those are valid. Raelians might claim that UFOs are real and intelligent beings from other worlds are here to guide us. While Scientologists would say that our minds are crippled by ghosts from outer space, right? So they all claim that their presuppositions must be assumed as part of reality. Atheists, on the other hand, assume only that reality exists and that we can use the methods of science to determine how reality works. That's it. The most minimal of assumptions, followed up with the rigor of the only reliable method of determining the truth that humanity has, 
with the result that we have a body of hard-won, solidly tested conclusions about reality that do not include afterlives, aliens, or ghosts in our brains. That's where we start, and those differences matter. So I can give you a few examples where these, these different attitudes cause real-world problems. So for instance, right now in Africa, children are being accused of being possessed by demons and of using magical powers to do great harm. If this were actually true, then I would agree that it's time to in initiate drastic extreme measures to rid the continent, continent of, of intrinsically evil, malignant monsters. That would be entirely justified if it were true. If we accepted certain assumptions that demons exist and that witchcraft actually works, then hey, maybe we ought to start setting orphans on fire. That would follow from reality. However, as it turns out, those assumptions are built on unreliable methods. Tradition, religious revelation, and actually a kind of venal demagoguery that's going among, on among the priests in that area. Use science and the picture changes. There are no demons, magic doesn't work, and those witch children are instead exposed as the victims of oppression and neglect. And the real and very human monsters are the witch hunters. Science completely changes your perspective on this problem. Here's another example, the status of women around the world. Uh, this is a situation perfectly analogous to the stories of witches. Women are automatically assigned a lower status. They're treated as lesser beings who are expected to be servile. And they're actually blamed for everything, from the temptation of us innocent, helpless men, to the, being the whole source of all evil in a fallen world. Again, the source of these absurd allegations are tradition, religious dogma, and the perpetuation of a pattern of exploitation. The whole myth falls apart when you examine it objectively and look for reliable evidence. Are women biologically inferior? No. Are they a greater source of evil than the male sex? No. <laughs> so reality should inform an enlightened human society about how to treat all of its members, but instead we're actively hampered by the delusions of fantasists. So this is our challenge. We all live in cultures where a significant number of people use deeply flawed methods of assessing the truth. Methods that lead them to commit horrible acts like murdering children or enslaving women, women or to neglect evidence of looming problems and the kind of short-term thinking that will have disastrous consequences for our grandchildren or even the species as a whole. We can't solve our problems unless we can see them clearly and are ready to, to strip away that obscuring veil of superstition and dogma. So science, that's our weapon. That's the atheist's favorite weapon is science, and it's a god killer. It's the greatest tool humanity has ever invented. It's taken us from being a hodgepodge of bickering near savages living in the mud and dying young of disease and childbirth and starvation and sword pokes to a hodgepodge of bickering near savages who sometimes walk on the moon, who sometimes cure diseases, who live twice as long as their predecessors, who can look deep into cells or far out to distant, distant galaxies. It has great, given us great power to accomplish marvelous things or to screw up the whole planet. Science, I think, also has the power to transform our sense of identity. Some of us are no, I imagine the majority of us here, no longer consider ourselves people of the word. We're not members of a special tribe bound together by narratives and rules in quaint old books. We are instead the people of reality. We are united by common knowledge, by a sense of universality, by our commitment to evidence. Personally, I find no sense of myself in the Judeo-Christian fairy tales I was brought up with. They are too narrow, they're too bigoted, they're too false. The words of my people are written in the strands of DNA I find in every cell of my body. And the story they tell is clear and inspiring. We are all products of the natural world. We are all built from star stuff. Stars died to create the elements that we are made of. And four billion years of churning life struggled and was born and died to shape us. We are close kin to every single human being on the planet without exception. And there is no tribe that is outside our family. And even deeper, we're related to every living thing on Earth. You simply cannot get any more universal than the scientific story of life. Now, I take far greater pride in the accomplishments of science than I do of my ethnic group, or my place in Western culture, or my particular ruling form of government, or least of all, the church I was brought up in. 
Uh, science bridges differences. I can find common ground with American scientists, Canadian scientists, Iranian scientists, German scientists, you name it. Now, maybe you aren't a scientist, strictly speaking, but you've read the latest book by Dawkins or Hawking, or you love David Attenborough's TV shows, or you're a bird watcher, or you like weekend hiking in the mountains. That makes us one people. That's enough to unite us in appreciation of a natural world. Now, the real power of science comes beyond the immediate effect of marking your tribe, though. It turns out that if you're disciplined and careful, if you reject ideas based on superstition, revelation, and tradition, and actually require confirmable evidence for any supposition about even mundane things, you find yourself on good, stable ground, and you're able to ask even deeper questions and get answers. And before you know it, you find yourself in possession of a strong chain of evidence that leads you to answers about the fundamental nature of the universe. And that's real power. We, as a society, have amazing deep power, thanks to science. Now, when theologians argue, they try to resolve differences by turning to murky sources, remote from anything fundamental. They open their holy texts, they cite fellow theologians, they try to reinterpret the words that have been reinterpreted many times before. But have you ever heard scientists argue? They do this all the time, but they don't resolve issues by appealing to higher authorities. They don't usually argue that because Richard Dawkins said it, it's settled. They don't argue that we have to parse Charles Darwin's words much more finely, and then we'll get at the truth. No, they say things like, I'm going to go in the lab and do an experiment to test that proposition. Or they say, I'm going to build a new instrument to measure that and see who's right. Our only authority is reality, and that's what we test all of our inferences against. When you're studying the world, your source of information must be the world. I'll have more respect for theologians whose ob object of study is God when they actually start querying their subject directly and get repeatable, verifiable answers. It's just absurd that people who make so many assertions about the supernatural never seem to actually study supernatural sources of information. It's almost as if they don't exist. <laughs> Now, I'm sniping a bit at religion, and there's a reason for that. Science and religion are in opposition. Faith is the atheist enemy. Remember, science is this process for figuring out how the world actually works. If you short circuit the process and declare that you already have the answer using an unreliable method like revelation or the interpretation of sacred texts, you're an enemy of science. If you simply assert your desired conclusion and ignore the fact that reality is rarely about the answer you want, you're an enemy of science. Truth is often uncomfortable. You have to value it because it's true, not because it makes you feel good. Now, the clearest examples of the dangers of religious thinking can be found in issues of science policy. Uh, questions about the environment, for instance, ought to be resolved by carefully ex careful examination of the evidence and proposed solutions examined by weighing the evidence, the costs and benefits, and so forth, right? That's the way you should do it. That's what you and I would do. Uh, that's how reasonable people operate, is by looking at the evidence and asking what really works. But not so when you consider how religious policy leaders operate. Instead, in addressing the problems of the world, they deny evidence in the world, of the world to favor mysticism and dogma. And I've already mentioned that politicians claim that we don't have to worry about climate change, global warming, and CO2 because in the Bible, God said we don't have to worry about a flood anymore. He promised it wouldn't happen. But these same people have another justification, an even worse justification, and that is God is also going to end the world soon, so we don't have to worry about it. It's the end times. Did you know this? It really is. Uh, according to a recent Pew survey, 40% of Americans, okay, Americans, we've already We've already prejudiced the survey, but all right. 40% of Americans <laughs> believe that Jesus is finally going to get around to fulfilling that promise he made 2,000 years ago of global death and judgment, and it's going to happen in our lifetimes by 2050. Kind of scary, huh? <laughs> but aren't we lucky? Jesus is coming in our lifetimes. We just have to cling on to life you know, in 30, 40 years, and oh, yeah, no problem. And here's the really creepy thing about that. Those affirmative respondents all think that, yes, we are lucky, this is a good thing, hooray for, the Armageddon, for Armageddon and the apocalypse, bring on famine, plague, plague, war, and death. The demented ghouls of the end times are actually a significant political lobby in the United States. They're fighting to support Israel, for instance, no matter what. And why? Not because they have actual political interest 
in the perpetuation of a state in the Middle East, it's because they have a prophecy in Revelation that the Jewish state must be restored in order to be destroyed in a nuclear holocaust, after which the surviving Jews will cheerfully convert to Christianity. <laughs> and all is good again. All you have to do is read the Left Behind books. You've heard of those out here? Yeah, it tells the whole story there. It's, it's amazing stuff. And it's weird because if a scientist or an atheist saw a cataclysm coming, say a meteor on collision course for Earth in 2050, we wouldn't be saying, hallelujah, physics is true. <laughs> Bring it on. Come on, come on. You're gonna, it's going to prove our faith in mathematics was, was deserved. No, we'd be trying to stop it, right? And that makes the Christian reaction so puzzling. If I actually believe that Jesus was coming to end the world, I'd be preparing right now. I would be stocking up on timber and nails. <laughs> Took care of them last time. We can repeat it this time. Now, I know I'm, I'm a very enthusiastic booster of science. That's one of the things I want to talk about here is, is I tend to get carried away with science. I think science is great. It's everything. Um, and I think many problems would be diminished if only everyone had a proper appreciation of empiricism and evidence. You know, it's, it's hard to justify burning witches when the requirement for good evidence of something that doesn't exist is made. They don't exist, therefore we can't set them on fire. But I have to say this, science is not enough. And it hurts to say that for me, but it's true. Uh, for one thing, science isn't perfect. It doesn't provide absolute truth and it's also subject to human fallacies. We're in a constant struggle to improve, but sometimes science can be used badly. For example, there are scientists out there who use the reality of human sexual and racial differences to in fa argue in favor of human sexual and racial inequalities. It's a completely wrong error. It's a serious category error, but we find it being proposed all the time. So sometimes the trappings of science are marshaled to support otherwise unsupportable conclusions. Science is also value neutral. Sure, sometimes it can illuminate issues and make good conclusions obvious. And I've given you examples of that. You know, don't set people on fire for being witches because witches don't exist. That makes the, the decision clear and easy. But in other cases, it can be readily shackled to causes of dubious ethical values. Say you've got a problem with a troublesome people you don't like very much. Science is just as happy to help you build remotely piloted drones so you can murder them without personal risk as it is to help you build schools and economic infrastructure to turn the troublesome into constructive partners. And actually, science would probably tell you that, it's, that wholesale murder is a lot cheaper and easier than the hard work of rebuilding communities. So we have to add something more. And what I see is that the atheist movement is steadily progressing towards that greater purpose, a movement dedicated to humanist causes, informed by science, and untainted by superstition. It's a transition that is happening very rapidly. It's flowering in just this last decade, and it gives me real hope for the future. You know, 20 years ago, atheism was mainly cranky old white men gathering to argue about the Bible. And then 10 years ago, we pushed beyond that. We advanced to cranky middle-aged white men griping about religion, but also talking a lot about science. That's a positive step forward. And now, I think, we're beginning to see women, people of color, and the young joining in the chorus. They're crying out for a greater range of priorities, including human rights, political change, and greater social justice. These are welcome changes. They are necessary changes that increase the breadth and appeal of secularism. It's no longer an abstract philosophy. It's now something with tangible material evidence. I would actually go so far as to suggest that right now that what we're seeing developing is a third wave of atheism. So after the new atheism, what's happening now? We're seeing an atheism emerging that's got a humanist core that is merging with other philosophies like uh, feminism, like uh, respect for gay and lesbian rights, uh, respect for minorities. All of these things are coming together in a great movement for social justice, which is a little bit more than the old new atheism, which is pr predominantly focused on science. So I think we can start talking about this. That's what I would like to see emerging over this weekend is a consensus on what the third wave atheism should be. Now, one of the great things about this weekend, judging from the titles of the talks, is that that's what this meeting is actually going to be about. Okay, God is dead. That's settled. 
We're not arguing about that here this weekend, are we? Um, religion is a reactionary force that poisons everything. Yeah, so we kind of resolve that. That's, that's the case. We'll forget about religion. We don't like it. So now it's time to settle down and set productive goals for this worldwide community of rationalists. And it's not going to be easy. There are all kinds of infighting and problems that will occur. There are people who disagree with particular goals, particular tactics. It's going to be a struggle to work this out in the near future. Right now, for instance, the internet community of atheists is racked with these paroxysms of argument over, of all things, the status of women. We're trying to decide whether women are eye candy and fuck toys for the privileged white men, or whether we're colleagues together in this movement. And I would have said some time ago, oh, that's easy, that's settled. We know what the answer is there, right? They're, they're equal partners in this effort. But surprisingly, uh, that debate is going on on the internet right now. I guess, I guess misogyny is not the sole prerogative of Christian and Islamic fundamentalists. There are also some atheists who feel this way. And it's sad to see that atheism has not become a synonym for a champion of equality. Not even when the science says we should be. That will change, and it must change. Women are standing up for their rights, and I'm not going to stand in their way. Women have greater cause to be resentful of the malignant influence of religion than we men, who have been the beneficiaries of patriarchal influence for generations. And anyone acquainted with the history of atheism and feminism knows that they've often gone arm in arm anyway. Because atheism is a philosophy of liberation. Religion has so often been a tool of oppression. What I've seen over and over in the last de decade is that the atheist groups find common cause on the right side of history, fighting for equality and justice for all oppressed groups. My own atheist communities at home in Minnesota are also active in the fight for gay marriage equality. Why? Because when you strip away the bogus religious rationalizations, there is no argument to be made against it. And our humanist values of respect for human dignity and autonomy simply cry out that this injustice cannot stand. It isn't science that says we must fight for equality, although of course it does inform us that we are all one people. It's something deeper, a sense of empathy and a loathing of unfairness that fuels this cause. And I think we should embrace it. It represents the universality of atheism. We have discarded the imaginary boundaries of a chosen people or favored races or privileged sexes and special revelations for anointed castes. We are all apes on a small planet together. Another feature of atheism that makes us potentially better citizens of the world is an honest appreciation of our mortality. We each have one life to live. There is no miraculous rescue at the end where all our sins and problems and injustices are shed and we go on to live in paradise. Now, this is it. Sorry. What we've got is all we'll ever have, all anyone will ever have. We don't get to salve our consciences and resign ourselves to inequity by telling ourselves the poor will have mansions of gold in the afterlife or that tyrants will get their comeuppance in hell. The truth is that those tyrants will die someday, but it will be in a, a luxurious finale with great hospital care and lots of lovely people around to take care of them. And meanwhile, some small child is going to die of star starvation in a Bombay slum, and no one will even know it existed. That's the reality. There are injustices that we must oppose on this earth because there's no heaven or hell to even the scale. The non-existence of an afterlife is a fact that science tells us. It's one of the fundamental substrates of our reality. It's a deep truth that ought to inform our decision making, contrary to the deep delusions of religion. But what we do with that knowledge requires that we go beyond science. Science is value neutral on whether, at the awareness of your inevitable demise, you should collapse in despair or you should joyfully embrace your moment of existence and celebrate. A positive atheism is going to give you a reason to do the latter. So there's no God. We're done with that. The next step, save a life, find a cause to battle for, educate a mind, rescue a species from extinction, make someone smile. That's what our atheism should be about. Because that's all there is. And it's a pretty damned wonderful situation we're in. Thank you. Do I deal with questions?
my name is Andres Teves. I come from Portugal. I find um, a big problem in some atheists because they value and they treat uh, science as a um, kind of authority. And I see that there are also alter alternatives like do-it-yourself science, citizen uh, scientists, and uh, shouldn't that be also be a value for uh, us atheists? So what, what, what was the alternative you proposed? Um, I, I say that we should always practice uh, science to, to understand it, because if you don't practice science, you end up just yes. having an, an authority uh, acceptance from, oh, I agree. Uh, from professional scientists. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I'm trying to say here is that that science should be the ground state of what we're interested in. That it's it's provides us a method for evaluating claims. So you know when I say something on the stage, like whatever I said, uh, you can question it using the tools of science. And that's good. That's what we want. And what I'm saying though is that to get beyond that bottom level, to get to something more, to advance human society, we also have to embrace other ideals besides science. Science is is the tool we use to accomplish our goals. The goals we choose, we have, we're kind of left bereft here. We don't have a God telling us what our goals are. We have to decide what our goals are. And I think for most of us, we would say that goals like equality for all people, all races, all sexes, is one of those goals we should be working towards. And then we use science to figure out how to accomplish it. You tell us uh, that science should be the basic uh, for atheists, for gay groups, for feminists, and so on. Uh, is it in reality so, are there studies, or is it in reality so that all of these groups are working not so scientific? Thank you. Oh, yeah, it, uh, this is true. We are human beings, right? Human beings screw up. There are lots of atheists who aren't thinking scientifically. I've met them. They're really annoying. <laughs> And this is also true that you'll find feminists who are operating on a purely emotional level. You will find uh, you know, gay people who are operating on a purely emotional level. Uh, but I would think that you know, the, the, the effective ones, the ones who are going to advance their cause, are going to be fairly intelligent about it. And that they are going to use you know, science as broadly defined as I put it. You know, I'm, I'm not saying you've got to put gayness under a microscope. I'm saying instead, uh, what, you, what you do is you use critical thinking, you use evaluation of the evidence, you look for patterns in behavior, and you try to decipher what's actually going on, and you, and you adjust your methods to that. So yeah, that, of course there will be screw-ups everywhere. Uh, I think, though, that you know, what we want is, is we want to aspire to achieve the truth, the truth of feminism, the truth of gay rights, the truth of atheism. And that takes science. We don't have any other method to determine truth. No other reliable method at all. This is the problem about gay marriage and homosexuality you supported on the name of atheism. I propose we keep these two, two topics separate. President Obama supported gay marriage and homosexuality because he says he's a good Christian and his Christianity told him to support homosexuality and gay marriage. Madam Hillary Clinton is a devout Methodist Christian. Your vice President Mr. Joe Biden is a devout Roman Catholic Jesuit and they support homosexuality and gay marriage because of their religious perspective. And that is clear that uh, homosexuality, gay marriage and atheism are two different things. I request you on the name of unity of atheism to keep these two matters separate. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I refuse to separate them. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the, first of all, yes, it, it is true that Obama and Biden have used their religion to justify their support for gay marriage. But you have to recognize that even Christians are going to be right every once in a while, right? They're not, they're not all uniformly wrong. Uh, you know I, know, I know Christian math teachers, and I'm not going to reject the calculus because a Christian thought it was right. Uh, same with this. That, that's a completely irrelevant argument. Um, I think what we should do is we should welcome 
the religious people who actually see through the delusions far enough to justify civil rights. The other point is that I think it's not very interesting to push the agenda that there is no God. It's a simple fact. It's a truth. You know, the, we don't argue much about this anymore. It's, it's more or less resolved, except among certain delusional people. But we have to think about what does that mean to us as, a, as, as a, the human species? And what it means is that we're here on our own. We're all together in this. And that means I refuse to say to my brother or my sister that I'm, I'm not one with you. I'm not sharing your causes. That we have to work together. And so what I would say is that you don't have to be atheist to be gay, right? You don't have to be gay to be an atheist, vice versa. These are, these are in a sense, very independent sorts of things. But I'm saying as, as a third wave atheist, what you have to do is have more respect for human dignity and human rights. That you have to be a, you have to fight for social justice beyond just the abstract philosophical position that there is no God. So I would say that, yeah, there's, there's, there are always going to be atheists who disagree because that's the way we are. We're rat bastards who just can't agree with anyone ever. That's OK. There go, so we're going to have people who disagree. We're not going to say, OK, you don't get to be an atheist. They're still an atheist, right? But I'm saying as a movement, as a group, we need to aspire to something more than just constantly reciting that mantra, there is no God, or a religion poisons everything, or whatever. We've got to do something with this cause. We've got to use these, these, these rational minds we have to do something productive and constructive in the world. And I say, social justice is a good thing to fight for. Hi. When is the time you think that there will be an atheist governor in Minnesota? And <laughs> Would you consider running for the office? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm a terrible administrator. I hate that stuff. So no, I, I don't want to do that. Um, as for the progression of the atheist cause in the United States, I think politically we're going pretty fast right now. That, that the important thing is that the, that the youth movement is becoming increasingly godless. And I think we're going to reach a tipping point. Right now, I suspect that there are many more atheists in the United States than anyone suspects. But because of the cultural stigma, you know, admitting you're an atheist means you're a communist and we ought to shoot you. Uh, because of that stigma, people aren't coming out and saying it. And they may even feel deep down that there's something really horrible and uncomfortable about the word. But that's changing. You know, we're, we're out now. We're coming out and we're saying, OK, I'm an atheist. And I haven't raped your sister, and I haven't shot your dog. So get used to us. You know, we're okay people. And I, I think that there will be a tipping point. I, you know, it might happen by 2050, which would fit with the apocalypse, right? So that may be what they're predicting. What about Jesse Ventura? What about him? He's godless. Yeah, he was already there. Yeah, we already had Jesse. But he was weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we had a godless governor who actually rejected religion. Um, he, did, he did not win by a majority, however. It was, there were some other complicating things, and he was a professional wrestler, so... <sighs> and, he, and conspiracy theorist, and he made some really bad movies, so... Yeah. You seem to be very fond about science. And this country has a society that has to face effect. The most supporters of Adolf Hitler was the most educated people in this country. They are scientists, doctors, medicine uh -huh. people, and law people. OK, that is one fact. OK, I like facts too. Yeah. I was part of a movement to defend the liberty of the internet and the internet was the most powerful instrument to spread science in this planet and we had to accept a fact that we lost a game against people that have totally different intentions, people that run Facebooks and other projects that are scary to me. Mm -hmm. And we have to 
also uh, accept that people that work in human uh, development to support the welfare of the soul, they find facts that are beyond science. They find old patterns that doesn't say science is wrong, but it says science is in okay. one hand not sufficient. The way oh, well, how a, we well, communicate is very interesting. Yes, so that's exactly what I'm saying. Though. Now, y yes, of course, Adolf Hitler took advantage of the technology of the time. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, Germany was the most advanced industrial state on the planet. So, you know, it would be very strange for him to have thrown that away. But, you know, it, it, there was a combination of influences there. It was also Catholicism and Lutheranism, lots of ideas bubbling in through here. And, you know, resentment of the end of World War it's, You know, I'm sure you guys know all this stuff, right? So anyway, uh, it's, it's a complicated story. But again, like, you don't reject it because it's been misused. And I would agree that science has the great potential to be misused. And that's why I'm saying that we have to be firm in our acceptance of more values than simply, oh, it works. Oh, I've got a bomb. Let's use it. You know, it's, it's, there, there are humanist values that we have to aspire to. You know, valuing human life, valuing equality. All of those things would negate many of those misuses. Just think if Adolf Hitler had been a humanist and a feminist and an atheist, I think it would have been a, he wouldn't have been so bad, right? <laughs> we could hope. Yeah, at least he wouldn't have the reason to murder a lot of people. I try to, for my question, a coherent sentence. Um, I have that problem all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree uh, with you that science is a tool uh, and we must combine it with humanist values so that yeah. we don't uh, have a, a second World War II or something like that, or third world war, essentially. Um, but I see a problem in that, and the problem is democracy. So democracy, I, I mean, I'm a huge support of democracy. Uh, it, I think it's the best uh, way we can have, but it's also um, a problematic one, because uh, the people who vote have to understand the science so that they can choose whom to vote for to represent the right views uh, to... to, to uh, um, see which view is scientifically correct and which one is not. And in our world, which, which, um, with so much information around, it's very complicated to be, to be uh, firm in all the subjects that yes. are essential. So how do we solve this problem? I do agree with you that it, it, it is a problem, but what that means is that there was something I didn't mention in my talk that we should also emphasize, and that's education that you need an informed citizenry for a dem democracy to work. That means we have to take Rupert Murdoch out and shoot him. <laughs> or at least shut down Fox News. You know, th that we've got all these sources of disinformation operating right now. I don't know about Germany, but in the United States, we've got the Republican Party actively trying to destroy state-run education in the country. Those are forces that conspire to undercut democracy. And I would agree with you 100%. Uh, we've got to somehow oppose all that. Better education, better support for students who want to go on to higher education. Uh, Fact-checking Fox News would be marvelous. There's lots of things that we should be doing. Uh, and I would think, you know, it would be wonderful if our leaders were actually setting an example, but it seems like both sides try to distort the other side as much as possible. So, yeah. More education. That's all I say. I don't, I, I don't think that's a problem for atheism, because I think we'd all support it. There is an urgent need to accelerate the speed of rationalism, questioning, science, and all those things. Yeah. But somehow, what all should be done? For example, uh, more workshops, more presentation, more reward, more recognition, more and more raising the questions level. Could yes. you give some more ideas for accelerating the speed of this reform? Yes. What it requires is amplification. That here, there's, there's a few hundred people here, right? And you're going to be listening this weekend, you're going to be learning things. Uh, if you just sit on it, you're useless to me. What you all need to do is you need to go home and you need to come out and talk to people. Push these ideas, communicate them to your family and your friends. 
uh, that what we need is more open communication that's going on. Think, you know, think of this as sort of a, a center point where you're getting all this information and then your job is to go out and radiate it to the rest of the world. So that's what you've got to do. Uh, I, I don't think we need a lot more of these sorts of sessions. What we need is more grassroots effort for these ideas to be disseminated more thoroughly. And yeah, if you've got, if you've got other talents, use them. You know, there, there are songwriters who get out there and do good music about atheism, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, and it's not Christian rock, that kind of, no, it's, it's a, you know, good stuff. Artists, uh, writers, write books, do all, whatever suits your talents. Get out there and propagate the ideas. That's how we're going to get this effect, is more of us participating. Yeah, just me standing up here. I'm one guy talking to a small bunch of people. We need the whole planet. You know, we're, we're short about seven billion people in this audience. <laughs> Regarding third wave atheism, you said that we should focus more on uh, social justice, civil rights, and less on the fact that there is no God. In That's settled, right? Yeah. yeah. And he said that Obama and other people who are Christian have the same values. Does this mean that atheists should sometimes ally with people who are not atheists oh, to achieve yes. those goals? Of course. Yeah. You know, uh, most, of the, most of the Christians I know in my little small town in Minnesota are decent, good people. I like them. They're friendly. Uh, they've just got this one wacky idea in their head. And as long as we don't touch the wacky idea and make them explode, <laughs> it's good. We can work together. And, and so, yeah, what we ought to be doing is building a community that involves everybody, not just atheists, and also tries to explain the real world to these poor, hampered, delusional people in our midst. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's all doable. I've worked with Christians. I've converted a few. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned different flavors of social justice movements often being supported by the same people. So, for example, in Minnesota, the gay and women's rights activists are essentially the same people. Uh -huh. uh, are you aware of any research into the underlying mechanisms of this happening? Why are, well, liberal people liberal and not just for specific um, yeah. causes, liberals and for others? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of some research. There's, uh, there's a guy named Jonathan Haidt who has been looking at the emotional basis of, of our behavior. Uh, I'm not a big fan of his work, except I think some of it's actually kind of valid. That, that what he points out is that you know there, there are people who value authority over equality, for instance. That some people want justice, other people want a boss to dictate what the answer should be. Um, and if you want justice, you tend to be on the side of gay rights and women's equality movements and all those sorts of things. And if you just care about authority, well, oh yeah, we just need a big man up there. And that's, that settles that issue. So yeah, it's a, it's a difference in attitude, what you want out of life. And I, th I think most atheists, as it turns out, associate more with the egalitarian side of the issue. There's probably exceptions. There's probably a few of you who's ready to yell at me. Feel free. <laughs> you said that you are primarily a teacher and that your university is not giving you any trouble. Can you, as a scientist, tell us in a few how your fundamental view is on your critical thinking and how the fundamental mechanism is which we should apply every day to make right. decisions? And then this could be some type of application of personal science so that everybody has a little tool set where he can yeah. check reality and not make the wrong decisions. Right. You know, I, I hate to say this because a lot of people cringe and cry when I say it, but the best tool you can have is a good grasp of basic mathematics. Ooh. Yeah. No, I, I see this over and over and again in my students. You can have some bright, enthusiastic, cheerful student who comes in all excited and wanting to learn stuff. And if they don't have the math background, it becomes such a barrier to progress. Even in biology, you know, I'm a biologist, and most people seem to think that biology doesn't involve any math at all, but freshman year, math, 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 every step of the way. So that's kind of a baseline ability that we look for in our students. If we get a student who comes in and they already know calculus, oh, we're just so happy because we know none of the basics are going to get in the way. They're not going to interfere with getting through the more advanced stuff. 
so that's that's a big thing is just simply knowing math uh, but of course there are mathematicians who are emotional idiots I know <laughs> so it's not a fail-safe sort of thing but it's a good first step and I've, I've actually suggested this to some people who shrieked in horror at me because I said I don't care if they learn evolution in high school if you just took them out of that class and taught them nothing but math they do better in college yeah yeah so learn your math calculus everyone should know calculus every one of you get to work thank you maybe